All right, if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel 11. We'll continue in our series this morning. Uh, as you're turning there to 1 Samuel 11, let um, me tell you a story. This is right after God saved me, and by right after, I do mean like a day later. Uh, I was on a missions trip uh, out to the East Coast with a choir I was a part of, a youth missions choir. And uh, we were singing in uh, homeless shelters, prisons, rehab clinics, places like that. And one song in particular that I remember us singing was, uh, He Never Failed Me Yet. And I don't think I could appreciate the irony at the time that struck me later of a group of middle school and high school students singing in homeless shelters, He Never Failed Me Yet. You can almost see these older men and women looking back at us going, "Mm mm-hmm, talk to me after the trials come, kid. There's a certain naivete, it felt like, in this youth choir singing these words. And yet, and yet, this wasn't actually a naive choice. First of all, the woman who chose the song for us, our director, was a mature woman of faith, profound, deep faith that was forged in trials. But it goes deeper than that, even. There's no naivete in singing the lyrics, He Never Failed Me Yet, because the lyrics are true regardless of circumstances, and evidenced by God's undeniable historical acts. And that's the lesson that we learn in our passage this morning. God has never failed, and God will never fail us. Which means the problem is not God, it's never on his side. The problem is that we don't trust God as we should. So how do we, how do we develop that sort of trust regardless of circumstances so that we can sing regardless of circumstances? He never failed me. He's never going to fail me. That's our question. And so uh, the the point we're going to try and take away from the passage is this, and the language is mostly taken from the passage, as we'll see. Consider what great things he has done so that you trust and obey your faithful deliverer. We're going to see that truth come out in three scenes, but really just telling one story. So let's take scene one, chapter 11, all of chapter 11, we'll read here, that the Lord delivers. Let me read it for us. Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen and he asked, What is wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out together as one When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah, 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, by the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be rescued. When the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever you like. The next day, Saul separated his men into three divisions, During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Turn these men over to us, that we may put them to death. But Saul said, No one will be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. So we've got a new enemy at this point. At least it's new to us. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit later on this, this enemy's been there all along. But it's, it's Nahash the Ammonite who besieges Jabesh Gilead. 
which is a town east of the Jordan River. If you remember uh, from the book of Joshua, they, they kind of come into the promised land, but two of the tribes, two and a half of the tribes go, you know, we kind of like this piece east of the Jordan. Can we stay here instead? So that's where we are in Jabesh Gilead, in the Transjordan Valley. The Gileadites, when uh, the Nahash shows up, they sue for peace. In fact, you can see they're actually willing to make Nahash king. They're going, it's fine. We'll be subject to you. So truly, what we've seen in our text the last few weeks is, is, is there that they've got no problem with a king like all the other nations because they're willing to make a king from one of the other nations, king over them even, despite his obvious cruelty, which was a mark of the kings of the other nations. This practice, by the way, that we get here, uh, Josephus records for us the whole idea of gouging out the right eye. Uh, that's because as you, you went into battle, you'd hold a, a shield up in front of your left eye to try and cover as much of your face as possible. And so then if your right eye is gone, well, you can't see, which can make it really difficult for you to win a battle. So that was the idea, making sure these, these people never rebel against their new king. The amazing part to me is that the men of Jabesh Gilead actually consider the deal. They're like, well, all right. You can give us a little time to think about it. Why? Why would they possibly consider it? Because they have no confidence that anyone is going to come and deliver them. So what Samuel said in our passage last week is certainly true. This is 1 Samuel 10, 19. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. God is the one who saves you. How come you don't have confidence in him? Well, because of what Samuel goes on to say is, instead of this, you rejected God and have said instead, no, make a, a, a king over us, appoint a king over us. But here we see they've got a king now, and they still don't trust that anyone will deliver them. They don't trust God's chosen king either. My favorite part of this story, by the way, is that after they send this message out to Nahash, he's like, that's cool, go ahead and muster an army. This is a, a bit arrogant. It's not going to go so well for him. But. All right, so news reaches God's hill, Gibeah of Saul. And these messengers have gone throughout Israel. Not much has happened, but when they get to Saul's town, something changes. Part of that, we've got to have a little background info here, is because of the close connection between Jabesh Gilead and Gibeah. Remember, 1 Samuel is coming right out of the book of Judges. Where does Judges end? Well, you, it's this awful story. You get this Levite who's uh, serving as priest uh, in a little idolatrous home religion, and he takes a concubine, and when they're there in Gibeah, the men of Gibeah gang rape this concubine and murder her. And so the Levite, who just abandoned her to the people, by the way, gets up the next morning and cuts her into little pieces and sends the little pieces throughout all Israel to say this is a bad thing, we should deal with this. It is a graphic and disturbing story, almost more so than any story in all of Scripture. Interesting, by the way, that Saul does something really similar. So, I don't know, it's something about Gibeah, like you just cut things into pieces. And so he cuts the oxen into pieces almost to draw this connection for us in case we missed it. Well, what happens then? Israel comes out as one. They're so horrified by what this, this, this story that just took place. And so they wipe out the tribe of Benjamin because Gibeah is in Benjamin. You know, Saul's a Benjamite and all that. They almost destroy them completely. There's just a few hundred men left. And now they're in this tremendous pickle because they're like, well, we promise not to give any of our daughters as wives to these men, but if we don't like, repopulate Benjamin, this tribe is just going to die off. What do we do? Did any town not show up? Because then, well, they didn't make that vow, plus we could just kill them all because they forgot to show up. Well, guess who didn't show up? Jabesh Gilead. And so what do they do? They annihilate the town. They go over there. They kill all the men and women in the town except for the unmarried virgins and give them as brides to these few hundred Benjamites that are left. What does that mean? It means we got relatives in these two towns. So when news comes from Jabesh Gilead to Gibeah, there are people going, well, that's my cousin. This is why they weep aloud and why Saul then also responds as he does. Saul is probably a descendant of this sort of odd circumstance that we have. 
So remember the book of Judges ends with this whole, there's no king in Israel, which is why it seems everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes, which has led to this, we accidentally murdered a whole tribe, and then we had to rape a village, and then, you know, all this stuff. Now there's a king, are things going to be different this time? That's the question. It seems to be exactly the point Saul was making. So he sends these messengers back through all Israel again, but with a very different message this time. Jabesh Gilead was looking for a deliverer, and now the God-appointed deliverer is compelling obedience to the cause of deliverance. He may not have attacked that Philistine outpost last week, but hey, this week he is going to act when the Spirit of God comes upon him. So deliverance arrives at Jabesh Gilead, 300,000 strong. And you got to appreciate the cunning of the men of this town because they tell Nahash the Ammonite, uh, tomorrow we will uh, surrender to you, is how it's translated. It almost feels like lying. What they actually say is, tomorrow we will come out to you. And the arrogant Ammonite goes, well, of course, they're coming out in surrender. They're actually coming out in battle, though. A little bit of humor here. Sure enough, the army shows up, they attack in the last watch of the night between 2 and 6 a.m. That's not when you start a battle, so this would have been quite a surprise, and that surprise leads to slaughter. Saul has finally announced himself on the national scene. He is the king. He is this promised deliverer. This leads the Israelites to go, well, all right, remember last week at the end here, they kind of said, who's this Saul guy? Why would we trust in him? Let's, let's get those guys and let's kill them. And Saul, uh, we're going to give Saul a pretty hard time throughout this book because he doesn't do so well, but this is a nice moment for him at least, where he says, this is not the day for putting anyone to death because this day, look at what he says, this day the Lord has rescued Israel. He recognizes what is very true that he is just an instrument of deliverance in the hands of the true deliverer, God. And then, verse 14, Samuel. We haven't seen Samuel at all in this chapter, but Samuel, apparently he's there, but Samuel now sets this happening in its historical context, where he says, let's go to Gilgal to renew the kingship. You've got to remember, we're on the wrong side of the Jordan River at this point, So almost everybody's got to come back across the Jordan, back into the promised land. And so what is Gilgal? Gilgal is the place where the Israelites first crossed the Jordan River on dry land as they begin the conquest in Joshua chapters 4 and 5. And they pile this uh, group of stones taken from the riverbed that's dry outside on the banks as this memorial to what God had done for them. And we read this in Joshua 5 verse 9. God speaking, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. They rolled these stones over, and God says that's because I've rolled the reproach of Egypt away, and so they call the place Gilgal, which means roll. That's where it comes from. What is Samuel's point? Why does he say, let's make sure we stop in Gilgal and talk about this? Because what Samuel's saying is, God did today what he has done before. Many, many times, in fact, he's delivered his people from bondage into promise. That's just what God does. That historical context kind of clarifies the ambiguity that we get in what Samuel says then. What exactly does it mean to renew the kingship? This word kingship keeps showing up, doesn't it? Every time it's shown up, I've said it's ambiguous here. So we get uh, Saul doesn't tell his uncle uh, that stuff about the kingship. We're going... Saul's kingship or God's kingship? And then Samuel explains the justice of the kingship. Saul's kingship or God's kingship? We're going to renew the kingship. Saul's kingship or God's kingship? Which one is it? It's both in every case. The worthless scoundrels get a second chance to acknowledge Saul as king, but Israel gets a second chance to honor God as king and trust him. Who is going to deliver you? Samuel's asking them. The tall guy who seems like he's got a little bit of an anger problem, going to come out some more, by the way, or the Lord who just keeps on delivering you? Which one do you want to trust? The question's not fully answered for us here either. I mean, they made Saul king before the Lord. That's good. That's promising. He's not a king like the other nations. He's a king before the Lord. 
That's good. But then we read that Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Anyone missing from that description? Yeah. Samuel. And Samuel speaks for God. Uh Uh-oh. Sure enough. So let's see what happens. I'm not guessing here because Samuel launches into a speech when he gets to Gilgal that's going to show he's not celebrating in quite the same way. Let's keep reading. So scene two, we got the Lord delivers. Well, the, the Lord always delivers. Chapter 12, let me read verses 1 to 15 for us. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and gray and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bride to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then stand here, because I'm going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God. So he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines, and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, we have forsaken the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now, deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jerubbabel, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel. And he delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around you, so that you lived in safety. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. I don't know if it's in your Bible, in my Bible at least, this uh, little section here is called Samuel's Farewell Speech. The uh, the section headings are are not inspired. Somebody else put them there, okay? And Samuel's Farewell Speech, I I get it, but it's it's a little odd considering Samuel's going to be on the stage for another eight chapters or so. It makes sense because we, we can tell something's changing still. What exactly is it? Seems obvious. Here you get this guy up there who's going, I'm old and gray, and here's this young and handsome guy next to me. And oh, by the way, here are my sons. We haven't talked about them in a while, but you remember that they're uh, the corrupt ones, the whole reason you asked for a king. They're here too. So it seems really clear. The new is replacing the old. This is just a changing of the guard, right? Well, Not quite. And Samuel's going to take great pains to make sure Israel understands exactly what is happening here. So he starts off with this long paragraph, Have I taken anything from you? Have I perverted justice in any way? This repetition of the word take is important because this word has shown up quite a bit in the book so far. We read about Hophni and Phinehas who kept taking what didn't belong to them. And then in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel explains, if you put a king over you, what's the king going to do? He's going to take. He's going to take your sons and daughters to work in his palace kind of thing. He's just going to take and take and take and take. Has Samuel been like that? Has Samuel been like the kings will be? Manifestly not. He has been a, a, a leader committed to the justice of the kingdom. Why does he ask for a witness before the Lord? before the Lord's anointed Saul, the king, because he wants the people to acknowledge the Lord's way worked. This leader that God had raised up was a good leader. God's ways tend to be pretty good, so why are they rejecting it? And that's exactly where he takes them. Starting there in verse 6, the Lord appointed Moses and Aaron. The Hebrew reads literally, the Lord made Moses and Aaron, which of course he did, he creates all of us, 
But that's the whole idea. He'd been raising up leaders for his people from the very beginning. When have they ever been without the leader they need at that moment? I mean, Moses and Aaron had their faults, sure. But God worked a pretty impressive deliverance through them, didn't he? Like, we all know what went down there, the exodus. And then in verse 7, he just starts this catalog of all the times God has done that. This pattern that, that holds throughout the book of Judges. He, he almost walks them through it. This is the whole book of Judges in a nutshell. The people sin by turning away from God and trusting in idols. So God brings pain into their lives, foreign oppression almost always, so that they remember what they have done. The people, when the pain finally gets bad enough, cry out to God for deliverance and repentance and faith, and then God delivers them by sending the leader they need at that moment. But what's the problem with that pattern? The problem in that pattern is not the leaders. The leaders are fine. In fact, we got some pretty good leaders. He lists them here. Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel. The problem is not the leaders. The problem is the unrelenting idolatry of the human heart. As evidenced in Israel's history. Is a king going to solve that problem? Not a chance. Not a chance. So why did you ask for one when Nahash threatened? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because they didn't ask for one when Nahash threatened. At least that's not what we saw in 1 Samuel 8. So a little interesting. We, we learned that Nahash must have entered the scene a little earlier. We just weren't told. We were so focused on the problem to the west of us, the Philistines, that we were paying no attention to the problem on the east of us, which, of course, the people of Jabesh Gilead cared quite a bit about, which was the Ammonite threat. And so that's at least part of what prompted chapter 8. This is one piece of them saying, no, 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 appoint a king over us. And Samuel's going, look back at your history. The Lord always delivers. He was king over you, but you wanted another. So this time the pattern breaks. That's the whole problem. You have the sin of idolatry. God brings consequences into their lives so that you've got a threat from the west and the east and the people don't cry out to God. They cry out for a king instead. Appoint a king over us. And Samuel says, so here he is. Here's your king. Here's the one you asked for. Remember his name is asked for. And then, other part of verse 13, this is the one the Lord has set over you. This is the king the people chose and at the same time, this is the king God chose. A little bit of a tension there, like whose king is this exactly? The tension is resolved in verse 14. If, okay, he can be both your king and God's king, if, if what? If you, if you fear the Lord, serve and obey him, both you and the king. Here's the incredible thing. Let me read you uh, how this is in the, in the Hebrew, literally though. Verse 14, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, dot, 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 there is no good there. Samuel's voice just trails off. Why? Because he knows that's not how it's going down anyway. So he just goes into, you know what, let me, let me start verse 15 here because this is the way it's actually going to happen. But if you do not obey the Lord, if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you and against your fathers. You see the problem? It's not God. It's not even God's leaders, because he's had a habit of raising up good ones. It's our twisted hearts. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We say a lot. The problem is they don't trust God to deliver them. We have the same problem. As soon as our circumstances change so that we're out of that tight spot, we start to rely on ourselves again or rely on whatever it is, the job, the approval, the finances, the just take your pick, right? We're so slow to learn. Like, we have guinea pigs in our household, reap cheap and peep cheap beloved pets. Um, guinea pigs are not bright creatures, Okay, not known for their intelligence, they aren't dolphins or something like that. So they may not be bright, but over the course of the last year and a half, every day when I walk downstairs, one of the first things I do is feed the guinea pigs their hay. Because it's happened so often, several hundred times now, these guinea pigs that are not smart have learned to distinguish my step on the stairs, and they freak out when I'm coming down. They do not freak out for Amy, who comes down before I do. They know. She doesn't give a squat. You gotta feed them, okay? 
It's okay. It's my job. These are my pets. I advocate for them. It's no problem. All right. So they, they know why. Not because they're bright, but just because of constant repetition, they figure this out. How come we're slower than guinea pigs? <laughs> like, that's the whole question here. Look how many times God has done this. Why do we keep trusting in idols instead? Is there any hope for Israel? Is there any hope for us? Let's keep reading and see. Scene three, the Lord delivers. The Lord always delivers. The Lord always will deliver. Verses 16 to 25. Let me finish the chapter. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called on the Lord, and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain, so all the people stood in awe of the Lord and Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die, for we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. So after considering the great things God has done in Israel's history, we now see the great things that he will do. Specifically, this miraculous sign that Samuel asks for. The wheat harvest happens during the dry season, so for a thunderstorm to come, especially just at somebody's command, is, is pretty amazing. Definitely miraculous. And so, as a result, the people stand in awe of God and Samuel, which is a little interesting. Let's talk about that. What's happening here is that they are truly experiencing the fear of the Lord, which we read about in verse 24, that they're, they're supposed to feel. Now, that phrase, the fear of the Lord, is a, it's a difficult phrase. Like, one of my daughters asked me this week, and reading the passage and preparing for Sunday, going, why are we supposed to fear God? It sounds a little odd. Now, of course, if you are alienated from God because you trust in idols instead, you should be terrified of God. And so that fear piece, that, that's, that's kind of literal. But if you have hidden yourself in God by your faith in him, it, what's meant is not terror, but a reverent awe. It is the awe that comes from knowing simultaneously what ought to happen to me because of my character and what will happen to me because of God's character. That's what's starting to dawn on the Israelites here. They finally understand that asking for a king was a great evil. And so they fear judgment. That's a good thing. That's God's grace at work in their lives, that they now fear his judgment. And so they ask Samuel to intercede. Like, you got to pray for us so we don't die, man. And it's interesting. They say, pray to the Lord your God. It's like they understand that they are alienated from God in this moment, which is why they're terrified. This is part of why they then stand in awe of Samuel as well. They're in awe of Samuel as God's mouthpiece. In essence, they, they fear God and God's powerful word. And so we notice then at this moment that Samuel is stepping into a new role. That's what's happening. He's not exiting the stage. He's just changing costumes at this point. He will no longer be judge, leader, because they got a new leader in Saul. Instead, he will be a prophet devoted to the twin prophetic ministries of instruction and intercession. And that's exactly what we see. Like, I just finished Chronicles this morning in my uh, yearly Bible reading. And uh, throughout Kings and Chronicles, you read the, these kings who get themselves into some trouble because they stop trusting God. And so prophets come in and say, dude, what are you doing? And then the king, hopefully, repents and says, pray for me. Now, that's what prophets do. They instruct and they intercede. What was interesting to me, so I was thinking about this this week, this is exactly what we see in Acts chapter 6 as well. When the apostles say, we can't be distracted by some of these other uh, uh, compassion ministries, we're going to turn that over to the deacons, because we have to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
intercession and instruction. So the pastor, the elder, has the same role in the church that the prophet had in Israel, prayerfully to remind God's people of God's great, unrelenting faithfulness, the sort of faithfulness that we're talking about here. God, in his power, can bring the storm. God, in his holiness, should bring the storm, specifically the storm of his wrath, his fierce anger at our sins. But God, in his goodness and mercy and love and grace, will deliver us from the storm, has delivered us from the storm, if we put our faith in Christ. This is why Samuel says not to be afraid. It's not because they're okay, because they're not. They're evil. It's because God is good. God is willing to forgive them their lack of trust at the exact same time that he provides them with a new reason to trust in him, the miraculous sign. I mean, he is so gracious, isn't he? And here's the thing. The primary reason we know we can trust God and this is hard, like this is going to blow minds, but it's right there in verse 22. The primary reason we trust is because God loves his glory. Not us, but his glory first and foremost. God is not an idolater in contrast to all of us. He knows that he is the supremely valuable being in all the universe, and he values himself supremely. He just acknowledges what is true about himself. Here's the thing. His salvation of sinners is the supreme display of his glory, as we've already seen. We have not just his holiness, but his love on display at the cross. Not just his power, but his wisdom. Not just his justice, but his grace. So, of course, he's going to continue saving us to display his glory, especially those of us who are called by his name. He, he, he binds his reputation to the reputation of his people, Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. So he does this, as it says in verse 22, for the sake of his great name, not for your sake, because he really likes you. That's not what the Bible teaches. And It's a greater security that comes from God doing this for the sake of his name. Because, to quote Isaiah, he will not let his glory pass to another. That's the security we have. Why does this matter? Let me quote John Piper here. He says this, Why is it important to be stunned by the God-centeredness of God? Because many people are willing to be God-centered as long as they feel that God is man-centered. It is a subtle danger. We may think we are centering our lives on God when we are really making him a means to some end, self-esteem, getting rid of those feelings of guilt, whatever it might be. That has implications for us, this truth. Paul actually spells out these implications to Timothy in exactly the same way that Samuel spells it out to Israel here. This is 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13 on the screen for you. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You see, this isn't cheap grace on display here. Because he loves his glory, I'm just good no matter what. No, if you deny him, he's going to deny you. But if we're faithless, God remains faithful to himself, committed to his glory. And that has implications for us. For example, it means he's going to keep his promises even when we break ours. So God promises David that one of his descendants is going to be on the throne forever. And guess what? Some of David's descendants were really lousy people. And yet God does not remove them. Why? He keeps saying this throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles. For the sake of your father David. Because I made a promise and I will not be known as a promise breaker. Or some of us, because we struggle with faithfulness, don't we? Still inclined to evil, as we saw in the catechism even today. But God says, no, no, no. If I have saved you, if you are among the elect, those that I have chosen in Christ, I will sanctify you. You will continue to become more and more like Jesus. You will persevere in the faith so that my name is not dishonored. That does mean that we have to respond, though. We don't deny him. And so here, what's the response? Fear the Lord, verse 24, and serve him faithfully. How do we do that? How do we teach ourselves to fear the Lord? We do that by considering what great things he has done. That's what produces this fearful trust, if I could say it that way, in us. 
and trust leads to obedience. Obedience is the child of true trust. Consider what great things he has done so that you trust and obey your faithful deliverer. The Lord delivers. The Lord always delivers. The Lord always will deliver, so trust him. And we turn a corner here, since we're not living in Samuel's age. We're living in the the church age now. And let's consider also how much greater our trust should be. Like Israel had no excuse. God had given them a prophet like Moses and a priest like Aaron and a whole slew of leaders like Gideon and Samson and Samuel and now even a king. But God has given us not just a prophet, but the prophet. God himself, who is the very word of God, clothed in human flesh. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has given us not just a priest, but the faithful high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he has been tempted in every way just as we have yet without sin. So they didn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sin, but instead can offer himself as the sacrifice once for all time for our sin. God has given us not just a king, but the son of David whose kingdom has come and will come fully when he returns so that he reigns forever in a kingdom of perfect justice. God has given us not just a deliverer from our earthly enemies, but a savior who delivers us from our truest enemies, sin and death and the powers of darkness. And this king, prophet, priest, savior lives to make intercession for us even now. And he has taught us what is good and right. There is no higher ethical teaching than the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. And he doesn't just pray for us so that we will not die, but he actually died in our place so that we would not die because of our sin. He is the better than Samuel, the better than Moses, the better than Gideon, the better than Barak, the better than you name it. Consider that. What sort of trust should that produce in us? He has never failed me despite my failing him time and time again so that he forgives me my lack of trust if I turn to him in faith in Christ and then gives me reasons to trust him more fully too. That that, that sawtooth history of Israel when we trust God and then we stop trusting God and we trust God and we stop trusting God, that plays out in our own lives too, doesn't it? Uh, Listen to what Thomas Brooks, the Puritan preacher, says, he says, everything that a man leans upon but God will be a dart that will certainly pierce his heart through and through. But he who leans only upon Christ lives the highest, choicest, safest, and sweetest life. I feel like I keep making this point, but that's because Israel was slow to learn and we are slow to learn too. We keep running back to idols. Here's the question again, on what do you lean To what idols do you keep turning until God brings enough pain into your life that you go, that's right, I should be trusting in him instead. Like, this can be insidiously subtle. Uh, A young woman, for example, who, who dresses just like all the other young women in her culture, wears the same bathing suit to the pool, same leggings, same shorts, same shirts, whatnot. No, no thought about this. Why? Maybe it's because she's hoping to attract the notice of a boy. Maybe it's just because she just wants to fit in with all the other girls. It could be either one, but do you see how subtle that idol of acceptance, of feeling loved or approved is? It could be disastrously obvious, too. Like the addict returning to his addiction, pornography, alcohol, heroin, shopping, I don't care what addiction it is, over and over again like a dog to vomit. Never realizing that it's never going to satisfy. You're trying to, to fill this hole in your heart, and instead you're just digging the hole deeper and deeper. You know, law of diminishing returns, whole idea. So let me... As you examine your heart and you start to see these things, let me make this plea. Let me make this plea. I want to speak, first of all, to the nominal Christians who are here in this room today. The most dangerous place to be is the one who's playing Christianity. Like that is the scariest place in the world to be. Those are the ones who should be terrified of God. There are some here because showing up to church is part of what it means to play Christian. There's no real trust in God, though. If you're leaning on something else, let me make this plea. It's going to sound strange, but I think it's biblical. If you're going to lean on something other than God, then just lean on it fully. Stop playing Christianity. Just go off and do it. If you think that will save you instead, then do that one for a while. To use Paul's language, just abandon your body to Satan for destruction in the hopes that your soul may be saved. But just do this before you go. 
ask God, God, if you exist, would you let this staff splinter in two and pierce my very heart so that I will know what a cruel master my false God is? And again, that piercing in two could be really obvious. Let's take our young woman again. Let's say she does manage to attract the notice of a boy, but it's the sort of boy who's attracted to a woman because the way she dresses, that's not a good boy to find. And so what happens? At the end of it, she is used and abandoned. Uh, That's a piercing she's going to notice. It could be really subtle in that your false God may give you absolutely everything you want. And so there you are, you got the spouse, you got the 2.4 kids, you got the McMansion, the Mercedes, you get the title, you get the promotion, whatever it is you want, and you just realize that there's still a gnawing ache inside of you. That's the subtle piercing that happens when you realize it is not enough. When that moment comes and you are pierced, turn and trust. God has provided for your forgiveness in Christ if you will turn to him and given you so many reasons to trust. And that's for all of us too. Look, for those of us who are here are going, no, I don't, I don't want to lean on anything else. I would like to lean on God and God alone. Examine your trust. Like start to look at where do you lean as soon as you start getting away from God. Like I know for me, it's achievement instantly. Soon as I stop preaching the gospel to myself, I'm going to lean. If I achieve things, then I win the approval of people, which gives me that sense of significance that I long for. It's the danger I face every time I step into the pulpit. All right, so you examine your trust, see where you start to lean, and then fear God instead and serve him faithfully. How do we produce godly fear? Consider what great things he has done. We keep coming back to this. Consider what great things he has done for us in Christ especially. Preach the gospel to yourself. If you keep preaching the gospel to yourself, you see the gospel meets all our needs, and you're going to discover you're standing upright. You're not leaning on anything anymore because the gospel meets our deepest needs, satisfies our deepest longings. Consider what great things he has done so that you trust and obey your faithful deliverer. Not leaning on false gods, promising a false deliverance that will never come, but that will splinter and pierce you instead, but leaning on Christ, the staff who will never splinter, never pierce you, but who was instead pierced for you, that you might lean fully on him. Let's pray. Lord, any time we come to Scripture, we come to the record of your overwhelming faithfulness to sinners, wretches like us. As we consider the great things that you have done, your faithfulness, your love, your holiness, your justice, your mercy and grace, it should produce the fear of the Lord in us, a deep, reverent, abiding trust. And that's what we ask for now, Lord. If there are those here this morning who either only pretending to trust or who not even claiming to trust, Lord, would you be gracious enough to them to let their idols fail them and in the midst of that pain to remind them of the great things you have done that they might turn and trust in you. For those of us who are trying to lean on you, Lord, would you help us stand upright by preaching the gospel to ourselves over and over and over again until we believe that you are enough, that you will satisfy, and that we can always trust in you. We ask this for the sake of your great name, that our lives would give you the glory that you deserve. Amen.